of the April 20th, 2017 board meeting to order. I got it right this time. Um, George, will you take roll? Sure. Colonel Evans? Here. Mr. Grozan? Here. Mrs. Ludwig? Here. Mr. Miko? Here. Mr. Naso? Here. All present. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, start off the meeting. Uh, we have executive session for the uh, to consider the employment of a public employee or official. Can I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Duke. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any discussion? George Staple. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Naso? Yes. We we'll enter into executive session at 633, which is immediately, and we will resume public session uh, when we come out because we'll have public business to discuss. So we'll come back out. Thank you. Let's just head right in. Yeah. Resume public session at 717. Um, that brings us to district goals. Um, welcome everybody. Um, oh, at this part of the meeting we have to talk about our district goals. We have three district goals. Student achievement being our number one goal and that's why we're all here. Um, we balance that against financial prudence which means we have to work with the money that we have and the funds that we have to maximize that so we can maximize the student achievement goal. And then to help us with both of those goals we have, we have a community involvement. So we, we, we reach out to the community and we, we ask for their help and we see where they can help us to either help us on the financial prudent side or help us on student achievement. And, um, and part of student achievement is why everybody's here tonight. So we're really excited with that. So with that, I will end that speech and we'll move on to recognition. Thank you, Mr. Naso, and thank you for everyone for being patient. And this meeting in April is always exciting as we can see a ton of recognitions of the great work our staff and teachers and students are doing. Um, led by our administrative staff. So we're going to start off with uh, high school principal, Mr. Mark Smithberger, uh, to present our National Merit Scholarship uh, commended students. Mark. Mr. Robert, members of the school board, thank you for having us here this evening. We appreciate it. I think next year, may have this is the high school, because most of us are, I think, here from the high school. So, <laughs> so we're excited to be here. Uh, one of the things we talk about always as a district is excellence in athletics, academics, and the arts. And tonight we're celebrating some of the excellence out of the high school. Um, as we, we think about these, our students going to recognize tonight, and I'll give some overarching statements and I'll get to actually the task at hand, is how proud I am of the hard work they put in daily to be successful. As I, as I look around here, you have National Merit Scholars, we have Mock Trial, we have DECA, we have Swimming here tonight, and, and the common theme of all these students is they go above and beyond and work really hard to be successful. Um, that happens during the school day and outside of the school day. And the students here are our role models for, for our other students, role models for the staff of, of what hard work does, and we're really proud of them. So let's give them a round of applause as a group. And for the sake of time, I'll try to stay on task here uh, with what I'm doing. Uh, first up are our National Merit uh, Scholarship Program students. Uh, we have three committed students. They come up at the podium. I'd appreciate that. So I know one of them right here. <laughs> Julia, right Michelle. Okay. And Mark, please don't rush. This is yeah. why we're here. It's the best part of the whole thing. So I was kidding, Carl. I, I go at my own pacing now. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, these, uh, we have three students that were commended this year. Uh, to help us understand what commended means, uh, in their junior year, students take the PSAT. That happens in, in October of the junior year. Nationally, 1.5 million students take the PSAT. To be in the program, you have to be in the top 50,000 of the entire country. So the students here commended tonight are in the top 50,000, means in the top 3% of the country on PSAT scores. That is an amazing feat. And so to get there, that's what they've done. Uh, so to recognize them properly, uh, we have Julia Faust. Congratulations. <laughs> Daniel Morse. Yes. Yes. Congratulations. 
Also committed was Michelle Kale. She's not here this evening, but I want to make sure we say her name so it can, can be heard. She was committed as well. Uh, this year we have one national merit finalist. Uh, and I don't think Zach's here tonight. I think Zach's doing lacrosse. I don't see Zach. Yeah, so I don't see Zach here with us tonight. Um, Zach's an example of most of our students here. As, as you see them here tonight, almost every one of them is involved in multiple things. So they're not just really good at the one thing they're here to be recognized for. They're involved in a lot. Um, a little bit about the National Merit Finalist Program. Um, every year, um, based on PSAT score, gets you in the program. Then, to be a finalist, they look at your SAT score as well as your high school course schedule and your GPA. And you have to write an essay and you go through the process. You have to get a letter direct from your school. And Zach is a finalist. So, start with 1.5 million students. They are now down to 15,000 who are finalists. Uh, they'll let us know if Zach actually won a scholarship or not, but that puts Zach in the top 1% of the country based on, on this criteria. So we are proud of Zach's accomplishments. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight. He's playing lacrosse, but I do want to make sure we recognize Zach Delicio as our national merit finalist for the 2016-17 school year. And other exciting news, last week we got our letter from College Board, and that's the PSAT program. And in a given year, we usually get four or five students who make the program. Uh, this year we had five. Next year's current junior class has 13 members who made the National Merit Scholar program. Uh, I can't release their names yet because of the, the way the program wants it to run, uh, but I will give a hint, some of them are here tonight. So. <laughs> Guess, you can guess which ones who, I don't know. <laughs> but no, they'll be, they'll be notified over the summer by uh, College Board. But it's exciting to see us continue to grow the program and our students succeeding year after year uh, through College Board. Um, it is my privilege at this point to um, bring up Ms. Allison Papish, our mock trial advisor. Our mock trial team made it to state this year. Uh, Ms. Papish and I have a lot in common. We both have social studies and we both are hyper competitive. People ask me, like, well, how, how is she acting? Like, think of your football coach in high school and how he might have acted. That's how Ms. Papish acts for his mock trial. If <laughs> you work that hard, she'll demand that much, she'll get you prepared, and our students will be successful. And she starts from day one, we're going to state. She writes it on the board. I walk in the room, we're going to state. It's just understood that's what's, what's going to happen here. And so she takes it very serious. She puts a ton of time into it. They practice for months and prep for uh, all their different levels. There's two levels prior to state as they go through. I'll let her talk about that. But I do want to highlight the students' hard work of giving up Monday evenings, week after week to get ready for it, as well as Ms. Papish. She does this on a volunteer basis. So this is something, it's a labor of love for her. Uh, she and I were talking beforehand. Um, most of the schools who do this in our area are private schools. Uh, and there's not another high school within about 25 miles who does it. Um, and she gets our kids prepared, and they got to state this year, got multiple teams out of the first round. So without further ado, Ms. Allison Papish. Hey, hello. Before I begin, I, I would like to thank the Strongsville Board of Education, uh, Principal Mark Smithberger, and Assistant Principal Mr. Tomino, uh, for supporting the mock trial program at SHS. Uh, we all truly appreciate your support. Uh, and your well wishes as we moved along in the competition. So we thank you for that. Um, I also want to recognize someone not here this evening, our legal advisor, Chris Kodinsky. He's an SHS alumni, a graduate of uh, The Ohio State University. Uh, he's a young attorney, and uh, he has a, a new practice and a newborn at home, and he still came, and it's, it's not just Monday night. It ends up being Monday night and perhaps Tuesday night and Wednesday night and sometimes Friday night and sometimes all day Saturday afternoon or in the morning. Uh, so we, <laughs> and so we really, we really appreciate him. He sacrifices his time and time away from his family and his practice to, to help uh, advance our mock trial. He also was part of the SHS mock trial team too. So he's our unsung hero. We're going to appreciate him a little bit later this week. Can you week. coach basketball? 
What? <laughs> I, I, I could be a spiritual coach, sure. <laughs> uh, each year, uh, just to give you an idea of the program, not many people are familiar with it, volunteer attorneys create an original case in Columbus around a current constitutional issue that's relevant to students. Uh, mock trial teams then work with an attorney or judge and a, a teacher uh, advisor to prepare their case from both the plaintiff and the defense side. Uh, competitors at the district, regional, and state levels are conducted in an uh, actual courtroom scored by panels of actual judges and attorneys. Uh, and so they are completely in character acting as attorneys, developing their own theories and their own arguments for the case. Uh, also citing court precedent, state, Ohio State precedent uh, from the Ohio Supreme Court as well as the United States Supreme Court precedent as it applies to the case. This year, over 330 Ohio teams competed. Ohio is the third largest uh, com uh, competition uh, in the United States. Uh, at the district level, 330, uh, and uh, over 40 teams competed this year in our district, which is the largest district in Ohio. Uh, less than half of those 40 moved on to regional. Uh, at regional, five counties are encompassed. Uh, of those, only 32 teams, less than 10%, actually even get to go to state. So while winning state is certainly an accomplishment, it is exhausting just being able to get to the state level. So um, uh, we compete, as Mark said, against some of the highest caliber schools, uh, and the competition is very difficult. But let me tell you about our team this year. Um, this talented group that you see here in the front row, as you know, have worked countless hours, weekends, late nights, from September through March. Uh, their extraordinary work ethic and dedication are certainly to be commended. Uh, raw talent and the gift of genius certainly didn't hurt either. Uh, but at this time, I would like to present this year's SHS Mock Trial State Qualifiers. First of all, you've already met our senior uh, on our team, our only senior, uh, Daniel Morris. Uh, and he's been in mock trial for four years. He was a witness for the defense, an attorney for the plaintiff, receiving awards for both of those categories. Uh, as you know, Dan plans to attend Ohio State University in the uh, next fall and major in economics. Uh, we're really gonna miss Dan uh, next year. Uh, but Dan, since you'll be in Columbus and we're gonna go there and win next year, mm -hmm. you can come and watch us <laughs> and, and, and uh, go out for dinner with us afterwards. Anyway, uh, we're gonna have three juniors returning next year, so we are really prepared uh, to uh, take on the competition. Uh, I'll talk first about uh, Satya uh, Anayagam, our fierce competitor. Uh, don't let that sheepish smile fool you. Uh, this guy is unbreakably tenacious in the courtroom. He won best attorney at district and at state. Uh, if you are an attorney and you face Satya, you, you lose. That's all, so. uh, the last of our juniors, or I'm sorry, the second of our juniors uh, is uh, Suraj Srinivasan. He's a three-year mock trial competitor. I've lost count of how many best attorney awards uh, uh, Suraj has uh, uh, achieved. Uh, he, his, uh, our teams win, not because of one person, because of what everyone brings to the, the challenge. Uh, however, our team always has an ace up our sleeve with Suresh. He's the virtuoso of mock trial. Judges give us feedback when we're all done and we've, we rest, rested our case. Uh, of Suraj, they uh, speak very highly, gifted, talented, accomplished, brilliant, and I think uh, I definitely agree with that. Uh, and these guys, they take down witnesses on cross-examination. It's impressive. <laughs> Uh, but speaking uh, uh, of uh, uh, our other juniors, I would like to also recognize Sean Paul Conda. He's been with us two years, also a junior returning next year. He was a witness for the defense and an attorney for the plaintiff. Um, and this was Sean's first year as an attorney. And so uh, he, he seemed to not be so sure he wanted to be an attorney at the start, but we kind of uh, told him he was going to do it anyway, and he did a fabulous <laughs> job uh, <laughs> uh, winning best witness uh, as well. Uh, and we look forward to having him next year in our state comp competition team. Um, also, uh, uh, not with us tonight is Raghav Shah. He's our only sophomore. Sophomores are rare at the state level competition. Uh, I didn't meet very many sophomores. I don't know about you. Uh, but he also was a witness on both sides. So he was our expert witness, and he was also an expert witness, but that's kind of an inside joke. Uh, literally, he has mock trial in his blood because his sister was on our last state competition team that we took to mock trial. Um, uh, so at this time, I, I really would like to individually recognize them with their uh, awards uh, that you have bestowed on them. Uh, Daniel, congratulations. Asham, Polikanda, 
congratulations. Uh, Satya Raigal, congratulations. Sir, Srinivasa, congratulations. Oh, you should all stand up. Our, our mock trial competitors. When I said they worked hard, I was not kidding. <laughs> I will leave all hours of the evening, and whenever I leave, I know when the gates open and I hear our, her voice or our attorney's voice in the classroom down the hall, I'm like, they're still practicing. They're still going. So once again, congratulations, guys. Uh, I'm not officially going to talk about the swim team tonight, but I want to say congratulations to the swimmers on being here. Thank you for all your hard work and all you've done uh, to represent our school and your accomplishments. A lot of Mr. Jolin and um, Coach Stacy will take care of that, but I want to make sure I, I recognize them. Uh, the last group I want to recognize tonight or bring forward uh, is our DECA group. Uh, every year we talk about what DECA has done and their accomplishments. Every year I talk about a new record of students going to state uh, being set. Uh, we'll do that again this year. This year we had 78 students from DECA qualify for the state competition. Uh, that is a testament to their hard work, their preparation, uh, their excitement to compete, uh, and Ms. Frenchie certainly getting them prepared for competition. Um, Ms. Frenchick, if you can come forward. <laughs> Ms. Frenchick has done something that, that even she's not done in the past. We got the most kids to qualify for state, and we are now hiring another teacher to help with the DECA program. We've grown it so much. <laughs> so she has created a, a, a bevy of excitement for our marketing program, uh, and it is exciting. For the first time this year, I got to go to Columbus with them for the state competition. And it was so exciting to see our students. First off, they are dressed as professionals. Uh, they're, they're ready to, ready to compete, and they, they're, they're practicing. They do a, a test in the evening. Next day, they do their competitions, multiple rounds, if you keep making it through, to see how prepared they are and their excitement to compete and see the plans they put together and answer questions. And it, it, it's just a, a great way for me as a principal to see how learning takes place in a real world setting. It's such, such a fun thing for me to be a part of, so thank you for inviting me to Columbus for the first time. I tried to behave myself so I get invited next year. I think I did okay. Uh, but once again, congratulations to all of our DECA award winners. Ms. Frenchick, we are proud of the work you have done and the students have done. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, hello. Um, I can't believe that we're back already. It seems like we were just here last year, but time's going pretty fast. So. Um, like Mr. Smithberger said, we had um, over 70 students qualify for the state competition, and 71 were able to participate uh, in the event. So from there, we had 30 of our students that made it to the final round. Um, they compete about against 50 to 60 people in their category all around the state. So there's over 2,000 students at the state level that are competing, so it's the best from each region that kind of comes together um, for our state conference. So it was very exciting that, you know, when you take a large group of students, um, you hope that you have a good return. So we had 30 that made it to the final round, and then we have seven students here that made it to the national competition, uh, which is taking place next week in Anaheim, California. So. Um, like Mr. Smithberger said too, the students take a written test the night before, which is comprehensive over things we go over in class, things we don't go over in class. It's um, a wide range of topics. Um, so they have to do some studying on their own also. And then they have a problem case study that they have to solve that they've just seen for the first time. And they sit down either by themselves or with a partner. And they have to uh, apply the knowledge that they've learned in class and through other, their um, work experience if they're a senior and come up with something quick out of the box and problem solve a real life situation. So it takes a lot of skill to not only go in front of someone and talk to them, but then also um, share your ideas of a problem. Um, this year also uh, was our first year that um, Mr. Tomino helped us implement a uh, career tech advisory board, so I'm very excited about that too. It helps us improve our program, um, being able to have professionals from the community come in and give 
us tips about um, things that graduates need to have when they leave and kind of bounce ideas off local professionals to get the business communities aspect mm -hmm. on our program. So we are very excited about the hard work that Mr. Tomino and Mr. Smithberger put into that program to get it um, officially started for us for this year. So we've had two official meetings for that too. Um, our students this year participated in the mock competition um, that Mr. Evans um, helped us with this year also. So I'm appreciative of that too to get us started. And one of the reasons I think that our program is so successful is because of all the support from everybody at every level, from their teachers to our administration to the school board and the community members that also pitch in and help us. So it's a, it's a, a nice collaborative effort from a lot of people. Um, I also wanted to say that this year too we have participated in the business expo to give them some more experience to kind of before we went out too. So um, without further ado, just want to introduce my students and kind of tell you what place they got, the ones that are here, the ones that aren't here um, are participating in either sports or after school jobs. So um, to start, I have um, the team of Joanne Munchauer and Julia Ostrowski received first place in the business law and ethics category. So if you want to come up. Um, they will be attending the national competition. Um, our next nationals team is Shannon McKinley. Uh, she will be going to The Ohio State University. And Morgan Pinzone, who will also be going to The Ohio State University. Um, also attending nationals will be Jarrett Reimer. He was unable to be here tonight. He'll be going to the University of Florida. Um, I have junior Allison Mehmed. She was um, fourth place in the quick serve category, so she will be attending the national competition too. Um, in second place, uh, Leah Marco for the automotive category, and she will be attending nationals also. Um, uh, hotel and lodging category was Kathleen Doyle. She's going to the University of Dayton. And our quick serve category of Danielle Abdallah. She received sixth place. She will be going to The Ohio State University. <laughs> The restaurant and food service category, Trisha Gregg, who's a junior, who plays seventh. Um, business services event, eighth place, Yulia Lazinski. Um, our team of uh, Bridget Hayes who's, and Mary Strumpel, both going to The Ohio State University. Neither one of them are able to be here tonight. Um, and then uh, marketing communications team of Brittany Fowles and Lauren Hill. Brittany will be attending Miami, and Lauren will be going to OU. Um, our team for hospitality services, Audrey Pagel and Dory Wilson, both juniors. Um, our travel and tourism team of Jessica Semmelsberger, is going to the University of Carolina, and Lucia Moffitt is going to Baldwin Wallace. Um, the hotel and lodging category, Ryan Ali, he's a junior, he's not with us tonight. Uh, buying and merchandising team of Phoebe and Maddie, um, they are also both juniors. Marketing communications team of Maria and Hannah. Congratulations. Also both juniors. Um, our marketing management team of Jared Anderson, who will be going to The Ohio State University, and Ben Harisco, who will be attending Cleveland State University. Uh, the sports and entertainment team of Olivia Colbianke, who's a junior, and Julia Fine, who is also a junior. And then our last team on the list of hospitality services, um, Aya and Riley. So it's very exciting to see a lot of juniors on the list uh, that will be coming back next year to compete for us. So we expect to have a nice large group next year. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome job as always. Thank you. Good. Thank Great job. Thank you. Thank you. you know my okay. <laughs> <laughs> Help me again. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> 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 it is hot up here. Uh,
Uh, before I introduce the swim, uh, excuse me, swim team, congratulations to all the students that have been recognized here this evening. Uh, certainly a great night to be a Mustang. Uh, Mr. Raba, Mrs. Pelko, Mr. Anagnostu, and members of the school board, it is my honor tonight to introduce to you our state championship qualifying swim team that we'll hear more about in just a minute. This has been a fantastic year for the Mustangs and our top programs. In Northeast Ohio and even across the rest of the state, there are very few programs that can match the success our swim, our swim team at Strongsville has achieved. The dedication and commitment of the student athletes in this swim program is unmatched and truly a great example of how hard work pays off with superior results. This couldn't be, this couldn't be possible without uh, tremendous coaching and support uh, so before I bring up Coach Stacy to talk about the swim team, I would definitely like to thank all of our parents and the rest of the community that supports not only our swim team, but all of our programs. And without you, we would not be able to realize the success we have these past few years. So thank you to the parents that are here tonight and also those that cannot be here. So now to tell you more about the results that our team has achieved this year, it is my privilege to introduce our head swim coach, Mr. Tom Stacy. Coach Stacy. <laughs> Coach Stacy was named Greater Cleveland Conference Coach of the Year this year, as well as the District Coach of the Year. He is a tremendous coach, and we are lucky to have him leading our Mustang swim program. Coach Stacy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for having the kids here to recognize them. Um, we're very fortunate to be in such a great community um, where we have the support we have for our swim team. Um, they have to put in a lot of hours and we have a tremendous facility. The staff at the rec center is, is really amazing. They treat those kids great. We get whatever we want from them. Um, sometimes um, maybe, we, maybe I can be a little bit difficult, but the kids are great. And again, Robin, especially the aquatics director at the rec center is amazing. So I'd like to thank her for everything she does. And again, um, part of the reason our team's so successful is the community. We have a, a great support here. Um, the developments in Strongsville have swim teams in the summer. Kids get to swim. Um, uh, they've had years ranging from six to 900 kids in the summer swimming in the different developments and at the rec center. And a lot of these kids come from that. Um, there's a lot of parents and people that aren't even a part of the high school swim team that contribute to that. Um, so that's tremendous. We also have a swim team in Strongsville, Swim Strongsville, um, that also helps contribute to the success of the swim team, um, from the parents that help out with that team to, to all the kids that swim on that team. Um, our success this year, we were very successful this year for the Strongsville High School team. The girls were 10 and 1. They won the Lakewood sectional, which they've won every year since 2006 now. Prior to that, uh, Magnificat had won every year that it had existed, the sectional. So now. We won every year since 2006. They won the Northwest District. They've now won districts, the girls, five of six years. And in swimming, dis the district is a fourth of the state. Swimming skips regionals, but it's a regional. It's a quarter of the state. And the girls have now won five of six years. And the year they didn't win, they were second, which is, is really impressive. They also finished 19th at the state competition. Um, the boys were six and five this year. They finished second at the Lakewood sectional, which is very impressive. Because um, last year they were sixth with, with one of the best swimmers uh, we've ever had, an All-American swimmer. And then by losing him, the guys stepped up. They got together and they, tr they performed tremendously. Finishing second to St. Ignatius, ahead of St. Edwards, ahead of all the other teams at Brunswick, Medina, Westlake, Rocky River that we have in our sectional, which is, is very impressive. They're also ninth at the district meet. Um, a couple things about them before I bring them up here. I just you talk about character a lot. These kids have great character. It's tremendous. Um, I think the community needs to know about it. At the state competition, honestly, at the district competition, there's a swim off um, from a swimmer from Brunswick and another not uh, local school. Our team was all behind the Brunswick girls lane cheering for her and the Brunswick coach was like, where are my kids? And it was Strongsville supporting the kid. At the state meet, I had parents from other teams in the stands remark about how supportive our team was of, like, of all the local teams. Um, so the kids, they, they want to be successful themselves, but they're very excited for the people naturally. Um, so they have a tremendous high level of sportsmanship, and it's tremendous as a coach to watch that. 
it makes you, it makes you feel excited even more to be around them because of that kind of thing. It's beyond just being excellent. Obviously, everyone at the state competition is excellent. Um, so now I'm going to introduce the swimmers, if they'd please come on up. Don't be shy, come on. <laughs> you can stand a little line or something. They're not shy when they train. <laughs> They're only shy when, when in these kind of situations. Um, first, I'd like to recognize Shauna Jones. Shauna was also one of six um, academic All-Americans for our, our high school swim team, and that's only awarded to seniors um, at the national level. So Shauna was, is also an academic All-American. Emily Con. Oh. I'm joking. Emily Kahn. <laughs> Julia Newbold. <laughs> Hannah O'Green. Way to go, Julia. I love the jackets. Yeah. Megan Pedersen. Megan's also an academic All American. Congratulations. Jordan Spencer. Lauren Stakar. Serena Stout. She could not make it today, but she was um, also an academic All American. For the boys, Ian Cox. Gare Green. Kyle Matson and Kyle actually juggled hockey and swimming this year and was successful at both, which is very impressive. <laughs> and Michael Whitehead. Thank you very much. wanted to My thank trouble. you because there's, <laughs> you know, we, we've talked a lot about sports up here recently you know and, and academics athletics and arts and when we talk about programs winning programs and programs that are run the way they're supposed to be run and the commitment from coaches and I've talked to Andy about this a lot and we you know we all share the same philosophy your program is the one that we always use as the example you know it's one of one or two programs that we talk about regularly about how it's integrated from K through 12, how you're involved, how, how it all works, how you're, the character that you build, and not just wins and losses, the character, the kids that you develop, the, all, the academic, all American. We just wanted you to know how much we think of you and your program and, and what a heck of a job you're doing. And at some point, I'd love to sit down with you and pick your brain a little bit about it because we, we need to model what you do across so many different things. And I just, we just respect the heck out of you, and we just wanted to thank you. No, oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for attending. And if you're still here and you're waiting for the break to go, <laughs> if you could go home, bring us home, bring us back a fan. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for being here. Thank you for the outstanding kids that you bring us each and every day, and have a great evening. I don't know. I can go back and check it out. I text I'll go back to that closet. Give me five minutes. I'll five minute break. Mr. Nason, we need a five minute break for Mr. Grozan to check the AC. Yes, granted. Okay, go. All right, thank you, Mr. Naso. Um, we do have another superintendent's report. We do have uh, two uh, presentations. Um, the first one, uh, Vicki is going to uh, share with us. As a part of our 2020 plan, um, we had a couple action steps in there to research 
uh, different programs, this different initiatives. You know, we've done, uh, we've, we've shared with the board uh, uh, curriculum coaches or literacy coaches, administrative interns. Um, one of the piece, uh, which can be a revenue generating source for a school district if done right, is, is open enrollment. Um, so again, this is just simply an exploration or research what's out there. And uh, Vicki uh, is just concluding her superintendent's internship. So what a great project to, to take on. I was thrilled that she would uh, help, help me out there. So I'm gonna turn it over to Vicki uh, to share her research. Thank you and good evening. So yes, if, if you like this and it's interesting and something um, that we like, then it was my idea. And if you hate it, Cameron made me do it. So um, open enrollment. I, it, it, from my perception of it, which is years ago when I worked in a district that had it, has changed quite a bit just by doing this research and realizing what's out there. Um, the state auditor did do a big study. Uh, and just to start, Ohio Revised Code does give us three options. No open enrollment, open enrollment for all, or just your adjacent districts. Um, and this is how open enrollment has grown. What really surprised me is 74% of the districts in Ohio now offer open enrollment to any district, and that was this school year. So only about 18% of the districts are no longer offering open enrollment. And just from my reading, what seems to be happening is there's more of that school choice, competition, options, and schools kind of looking for revenue. So this is the full report, and I have all the links in here, and we can send that. Um, but Dave Yost did do a report on the benefits, costs and benefits of open enrollment. And what they found is that if districts use their open enrollment policies effectively, it is a revenue source, and it won't generate additional expenses. So the four districts that they highlighted, Austin Town, Coventry, Hubbard Exempted, and Madison. And if you just want to go to the bottom line, you can see that Hubbard made a million dollars on their open enrollment. One of the um, key pieces is that any student who's open enrolled, their state revenue goes to the, the attending district. So they don't get any of that local revenue, but all of that state revenue does follow them and most of the time it's more state revenue than resident students are receiving in their district. So is the state revenue, sorry, is the state revenue funds that we get, you said it's more than what we get because ours is greatly curtailed what we get. Yes, it, so it's right? about $6,000. Yeah, so we get the so full? It's, it's the full $6,000, six, the, $6, the state share index does not apply. Yeah. So it's the same thing with the deduction as well for kids that are going to an outside school district. The entire 6,000 is taking out um, the state share index. Does not apply to that. And Vicki, did the auditor's report, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have a bunch of questions. The last slide, Hubbard made money. They're a large district. Coventry is a smaller district, if I'm assuming this, we're talking Summit County. Was there any indications of why yes. some lost, some won? Yes, I'll get to that. Perfect, okay, thank you. Manageable. So, and if you look, if you kind of keep in mind too, you can see the percents. Um, and I will say, I visited Northwestern local schools earlier to look at their robotics program. And when they gave me sort of their profile, they had in there that they credited some of their success to the fact that they had about 240 open enrolled students. Um, and I hadn't been doing this research yet, and so I, was, I wasn't quite sure why that helped them, but after I did all of this, I realized. Um, so I do have some fast facts. Uh, open enrollment, when managed properly, can offer districts some healthier finances. Uh, when related expenses are overlooked, that's when you get into trouble. So we can set the policy, the, the districts who are managing properly, they set their policy so that they never have to expand programs because of open enrolled students. So in other words, if we have a capacity to have 28 students in a classroom, and we only have 22, we can say we can open enroll that many students. But we will not take any more students if it means we have to increase teaching staff. You don't have to um, accept students if it will, will increase any kind of program, like a special education program. So um, 
And again, I think we covered this, the 6,000 per year. So school districts create their own application procedures and timelines, and as long as you follow those, so you just have to say what you're going to do, and that's what you have to do. Um, classroom capacity is, can be the reason for denying admission, provided that you've defined those capacity limits. Transportation is provided by the parents. And then the, the number six, if a student has been suspended or expelled for 10 consecutive days or more during the current or preceding term for which they are requesting admission, the district may deny admission. So I had experienced open enrollment more on those terms where I was in a district where they would get students who came in that had discipline issues. So we sort of had a, you know, it wasn't always a good thing for us. Um, but you can deny students under those situations. Um, there is also a clause, basically, that our staff, students, our children could come here under open enrollment without opening up all of the rest of that. So you could do staff without mm -hmm. doing adjacent or full? Yes. And those other options, okay. And then, really, the basic question we would ask as we debated if we were going to do this or not is what objective are we trying to achieve through open enrollment? Some districts do it for um, athletic reasons their athletic programs, some do it just as a revenue stream, some do it to be more competitive. So they're starting to basically say, we have a lot to offer here in Strongsville, you know, would you like to come into our district? And definitely can be managed. So what like schools like Hubbard did is the principals would notify the superintendent every spring, and they would basically say, we have room here. So maybe this elementary school has no room, but this elementary has room, and it's all based on capacity. And of course, you'd have to be careful with managing those numbers. If all of a sudden we had students moving in, um, you know, you wouldn't want to overbook that way. But and you would implement all kinds of your all of your formal policies uh, as far as ratios, and only take students where you needed them. Vicky, once a student is in from another district, do, can they stay in then? Do they count every as year? Own? Every year they would apply, but they do get priority if they're if they've been there for a year, then they're supposed to get priority. Okay. And then just, of course, looking at the costs and benefits, you think about facilities, um, technology use, staffing and services, so how much more would we have to provide? And that's what the state auditor, when they looked at that, they really looked closely at what those students were costing the district. Um, and again, it was just part of that managed piece. And then a little bit of the summary table, uh, the, what the program elements as far as revenue, costs associated with the students. This is all things I've talked about. And then you see at the bottom, for example, if we had 100 open enroll students, it would be $600,000. I have my resources here at the end. Okay. Any questions? I Do mean, that's I have good. several. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, Vicki, first, can you send that to us? Because mm -hmm. um, I actually would have liked to have seen that prior to I think Cameron sent it. Did it? Yeah, it come through? Yeah. Okay. Um, transportation. Mm -hmm. So we've got a we've got a student that is accepted open enrollment. Do we provide the transportation? Parents. Parents have to do that. Mm -hmm. And we do okay. we do not have to provide any services that would be an additional cost to us, as long as we put that in writing in our policies. Do the more successful schools? I would think, if you're looking at this as a a, gen a revenue generator or however you would do it do they have a dedicated someone dedicated on the staff who just manages this program to some extent because I would think it would you know, be, to do it you'd really have to be focused on it right because if you yes. if you want to make sure you get the numbers right so that you don't you know if you go two or three over all of a sudden right. wow you've got to add a class you yes. got to add a teacher and all of a sudden what you thought was a generator is not um, so do, do they have someone dedicated I, to it or? I haven't gone that far into it, but that would be something where I, I could call districts and mm -hmm. ask them, you know, how do you yep. manage your open enrollment plan? I would imagine so, because it did seem like it would be You can very call the green ones, Vicki. <laughs> yes, I'll call them. The green ones. I'll yeah. call them, so that's what I have. Any other questions? No. Just as a comment, nope. <clears throat> I would think that Strongsville would be a district that a large number of people, even in the adjacent communities, would be extremely okay. interested in. 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just look at the successes that we have out of our high school, the programs, the ability of getting college credit plus, and all those things. Um, when you've got people selling homes and they're advertising Strongsville schools, I mean, it, it must tell you something when business people are trying to mm -hmm. sell homes in Strongsville because their children could come to our school district. Yeah. At the um, same time, though, it's it's a, you know, our schools and Mr. Dooner's here from the city council. Our schools are a draw to this community, and I think we have to be careful with what we decide to do because we're building Strongsville, right? And we want to we want to draw people into the community. And then if you go to open enrollment, there's really no reason to move here. You can go, you know, you can stay in Columbia Station, you can stay in Brunswick, you can stay in communities like that. And then your children could still attend, possibly attend, right? right? There's no guarantee you'll get in. But I mean, so we just have to be careful with that. I think it's something we'd want to explore maybe a little bit with the city, but I'm really for the staff. I mean, that's something I think we mm -hmm. should really look into because I think there's certain staff members who have children who would, you know, it just benefits us if, you know, just like, you know, George being the treasurer, his children being in the district, you know, all our children in the district, we have right. a vested interest. I think that it's, it's, it's yeah, magnified absolutely. if you can bring your children in on staff level. I just think we should, something we should, we should think and about. If, whether, we, if we have the declining enrollment and maybe, because it is a temporary thing, it's a year to year, you could change your policies. It's something that maybe the district looks at for a short time period um, and then enrollment picks up. I wouldn't want to, if we let children in, I don't want to change our policy and kick them out and then two years later they can come back. You know, we've got to be, at least the people who come in, we've got to be, we have to have a serious, you know, mm -hmm. long-term right. commitment to that practice. And I would be very curious to know what communities our size, um, the, the West Lakes, the Avon Lakes, the, the Jackson Townships, um, Brunswick, those communities either surrounding us or who are of similar size and economic, I don't say status, but what, what the, the state would declare as us. I would, Solons, I would be curious to see if they do enroll, open enrollment of any sort and also to have a conversation, I mean, more Cameron for you, sure. to have that conversation with the superintendent and be able to say, you know, what were the pluses and minuses? Have you ever looked at it? Yeah, and, and what, percent do, so. what we what we have is, you know, the state does put out that what are similar districts, districts to Strongsville, and we internally have taken that list and also added, you know, other premier districts that uh, we compare ourselves to. So um, we can go through that list that Vicki has and the list that we have and give a summary to the board. Uh, you know, I guess what we're asking for, we wanted to give just kind of this introductory overview. Uh, you, you know, Carl, I know you mentioned the staff. Uh, you know, we'll get some of those inform information together, but uh, really we just wanted to provide you with an overview. And as you think about it, if, if there's any more work that you would like us to do or present or share with the board, other than what we've just talked about, uh, we can do that. Uh, but at this point, we'll kind of get you those comparables. Uh, and, and look a, a little bit more deeply into the staff uh, piece of it. Um, and the, the rest of it's out there as a FYI until uh, there's a feeling that we may want to explore that a little more fully. I, I like the idea of generates revenue, but at the same time, we're building a premier district and we just have to make sure that what we do Correct, doesn't impact our city or our schools. And we make sure that we, we do the, it, it's, it's a bigger picture than that, right? Mm -hmm. But certainly revenue is a good, enough, yeah. good thing to have. Jane or Richard, any thoughts? Oh, I just, if you know, you are going to move ahead with something like this, we have to have very, very clear objective. What is right. our goal that we're trying to achieve? Is it to round out those classrooms that, oh, we only have 15 kids in a class, so then we can add. I think if we're at a 22 to just get that extra revenue at the expense of educating our Strongsville students, I'm not there yet. I don't think that's a good road to go down. Mm -hmm. But. Um, it's an interesting topic to explore. And like you said, so many other districts are doing it. Um, there's, there are other pitfalls that I've talked with other school districts that have this open enrollment and, and things that haven't gone so smoothly, so. I would just say my, the, the thing that I would wanna think more deeply about is just the philosophical uh, decision. Currently, the majority of our revenue comes from our residents. It comes from local taxes. Uh, as much as the uh, state provides, it is the smallest portion of it. And so we're fundamentally switching what we're asking our community to do. Currently, we ask them to
pay their property tax to educate the students of Strongsville. Um, I, it, philosophically, it's a big change to say we're now going to ask you to pay your property tax to educate some child from some other city. Um, and that child's parents doesn't do, does not contribute any property tax to Strongsville. Um, so I'd want to make sure we uh, are aware of that change um, and, and what that could mean uh, for our voters. Yep, I agree. Correct. Any other questions for Vicki? Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, I've asked Erin uh, Green to come back. Earlier in the school year, she gave a presentation about all the work that uh, she had put in place uh, to enhance professional development uh, for our staff. And it was requested at that time to do a follow-up after kind of the majority of the year is through, which hard to believe, but we're here. Uh, so Aaron, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of talk about how professional development uh, in your plan went this year. Sure, thank you. So as you know, we offer a lot of different types of professional development. So we have the early release days, we have um, PD days for the staff, we have technology sessions, we have where staff go off campus to get PD. Uh, the one that I'm gonna specifically reference tonight is what Cameron just talked about. Um, if you recall, in the fall I had the big book of PD. Um, that was our first time trying it in that way where we put out all the sessions in the fall for the entire year. Um, just wanna give you a little feedback and report on how that went. So we, I uh, surveyed in the fall staff, you know, what sessions would you like to see? and I took the top 38 rank ordered sessions and created PD after school sessions from those. Um, so what was offered, if you recall, um, we had 22 elementary offerings, we did 18 secondary, and then one was a combo that could be both elementary or secondary. So excluding any of the technology and the instructional coaching sessions, uh, we offered right around 40, 41 sessions. We had 20 staff that signed up to attend a session. Um, about 15 of those signed up for more than one session. So weighing, you know, running a session for one person versus helping them individually, I ended up running five sessions for the whole year. Um, if they had less than three participants, then I just reached out to the individual participants and I said, I'll be glad to come you know, to your classroom, invite me, I'll work with you at any time. I'm not gonna make you come to the board office and you know, sit through a PD session. So that worked as well. Um, did get some feedback. I know that Carl had asked, you know, make sure you do a, some feedback. We wanna hear how participants feel it went. And although slim, um, we did have feedback from those who mm -hmm. attended. And um, one of the questions I asked them, you know, to what extent will your participation in this PD change your practice? And it was a scale from one to four. The average response was a 3.5, very much, that's in the good way, you know, very much what I learned, I will apply, plan to implement. Um, also asked them for feedback about the session, things I could do to improve, things that, you know, they wish there were more of or there was less of, and got some interesting feedback on that and very helpful. And then I also asked if I could come into their classrooms and watch implementation. And mm -hmm. that was split. Um, about half of them said, sure, come in any time. The other half said, okay, but schedule it with me first. Mm -hmm. So that was encouraging as well, so I could actually see what was going on in the classrooms. Um, I did take advantage of that, and it was nice to see, uh, exciting to see, you know, just the follow-up with that. From this, there are a couple things I learned and you know, changes I wanna implement for next year. Um, one of those being, and Cameron suggested when we met mid-year, maybe try going to the buildings to offer the sessions. So I was asking people to come here. Um, sometimes after a, a day at the building, it might be challenging to fight traffic and get here. So toward the end of the year, I did do that and participation was much better. So that is something I wanna build on for next year. Um, I think sending the whole year at once was a little too much, it was a little overwhelming. So next year I plan to do it by semester, and that way it's not, you know, here's eight months of PD, figure out what you want to attend. I um, think I will narrow the topics. So, you know, 38 topics, it's a lot, but I want to go a little bit deeper with fewer topics, and I think that will help garner more interest. Uh, we started putting in principal's newsletters. You know, reminder, we have this PD session coming up. 
And that was helpful too. Uh, these, again, these are changes we implemented midstream. That way, you know, it would kind of jog the memory of, oh, either <clears throat> I signed up for that or that looks interesting. I wanna make sure that I sign up for that at this point. Um, I also thought that I would enlist the help of staff. So thus far, I've sent out a survey to elementary teachers asking, you know, would you be interested in serving on a kind of an ad hoc committee that helps me develop PD and meets the needs of what you're looking for? And I'll do the same with middle and high school. But I did have 12 elementary teachers say, yes, they would be interested. So I think that will be helpful for me as well. Um, even though I had the topics that they wanted, I just think it's always nice to have them in a room and, and kind of feed off of each other. You know, let's do this. I know there's a lot of interest in doing go math or whatever the topic might be. And lastly, I think I want to offer um, different times of the day. So every one that I offered was right after school. I know there are other commitments that some have. So I can look at going into during the day, during their TBTs. I could do some before school and just kind of, you know, vary when the timing is. So that is my follow up on how the PD went. Questions that I can answer or? Yeah, I have a question. Sure thing. Aaron, how many teachers participated total? Um, we had 20 that signed up. So I did a Google survey where they, 20 signed up saying they were interested in Cameron, at least one session. Educate me here. What other professional development requirements do we have every year? We have, uh, during the year, we have two full days and we have a half day uh, that is required. All of this was optional to enhance uh, what we're doing uh, throughout the district. Okay, so they only get two and a half days a year, a school year of professional development as it stands, right? Well, it's they, mandatory. We, mandatory that the district puts on. There's other professional development that we send teachers to, but in district is two and a half days that Aaron uh, and all of our directors plan. How does that compare to surrounding districts? I think it's, you know, you ha it's pretty average. You have some that have maybe, I think two to four, somewhere in there is the average range. There's n nothing scientific about it, but would you say, Aaron, that's accurate? That's what I'm familiar with, yes, in that range. Two yeah. to four days? Mm -hmm. Two to four days. Yeah. So we have two and a half. And, um, so the early one. release, we do that. Um, yeah. We did that three times this year. Yeah, correct. And then there are a lot of other, like I said, I didn't include Vicki's technology sessions. She had good turnout for those. So there are other opportunities staff are taking advantage of. This was solely mine. Okay. Clarification, you had 20 sign up? Correct. 20 show up? Um, if they had fewer than three participants, I reached out to them. So, so did you, I mean, did you do pro dev for 20 bodies? Yes. Okay. And this was all self-selected. There was no principal that said, I said, you know, they're having this great product, you know, professional development day, go see this, no. Yeah, this was all, it was self-selected to extend beyond uh, what we were offering as a district, either during those PD days or new programs. So for example, a lot of our teachers at the elementary level were interested in guided math. Um, so we sent some teachers out to guided math and then Aaron you know, worked with the teachers to say, hey, if you wanna learn more about guided math, we're gonna do this after school session, come see it. We're gonna have some of the teachers that actually went to the training, put on some professional development. Um, and, and those are the things uh, that we were looking at extending and enriching what was already provided. And like Aaron said, based on the topic that uh, the, the teachers were interested in. So, you know, it's been, as Aaron desc described, it's been a, a learning process throughout the year to look how is it going to be most meaningful? What's the time frame? What's the location? And as she's evolved it, it's, it's become uh, more widely used than it was at the beginning. If it's at the elementary buildings, per se, um, during the day, it, like for third grade, right? all of the third grade teachers don't necessarily have free period at the same time, right. do they? Unless it's lunch. No, so I wouldn't do a grade level specific okay. during an elementary building. That would be more, you know, we did some sessions with um, the gifted coordinator at the middle, uh, the middle school <laughs> building and they went during the team time. <clears throat> okay. And that worked really well because teachers were there. They, you know, it was easy to get there and it was really productive. Again, that's outside of what I talked about here. So, so with such a small number, it's hard to try to make any kind of uh, statement about anything. Um, but 
having it and having the opportunity for it obviously is valuable and as long as the uh, as long as the sessions are useful and have some meat to them the more bodies you get into them the better off we're going to be right what kind of number do you want to set for yourself for next year with regards to participants yeah because you can measure you know one of the things you can do you can and you know this you can measure sure. lots of things but at a certain point when you're when your sample is this small you're you're measuring you know groups of one groups of two right. but a simple measure that is going to improve would just be if 20 if 20 were this year if I can get 80 next year now I'm going to start getting samples where I can start saying sure what can I do? So I'm just asking for your competitive spirit and what's... 81. 81, I like that. <laughs> no, ready. I would like to see, obviously, right, no, you know, I know a that, third of the staff. Have to have a reasonable you know, number. You right. know, we have 280 staff currently. So well, it's low, low 300, isn't it? Like three thirds. Exactly. Okay, three hundred. So yeah. I mean, hundred. I would say I would be happy with a third of the staff participating. So sure. That's probably aggressive, and I'm not going to tell you not to shoot for that number. But um, I'm just going to write up, write down whatever number you give me right now. I heard one. One hundred. One hundred. Awesome. <laughs> Twenty-two. <laughs> I shoot low. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Ten percent right. increase. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that ends the, my reports of the community. Right. Brings us to public comment. Um, I don't see any slips, so we don't have any. Um, approval of minutes. Uh, the March sixteenth, two thousand seventeen board meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Duke. Do I have a second? Blend. Second. You are correct. <clears throat> any discussion? George, take roll. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Nisa? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. Treasurer's report? Thank you, Mr. Nisa. Um, I have a few items for your consideration tonight. Uh, the first item is the financial report for the month ending March 31st, 2017. Uh, could be found on Exhibit A. Also, I have, along with my monthly uh, supplemental presentation, so I'm going to excuse myself from the podium. A little squeaky tonight. <laughs> New shoes. <laughs> and uh, I know you got heard a lot tonight, so I'll try and be brief and just touch on the highlights. Um, district goals, as we touch, touched on, uh, this area is financial prudence, um, fiscal prudence throughout the years, um, just restating the past the things that we've talked about in the past. Um, going into the general fund summary, um, as of <coughs> uh, March of 2016, compared to March of 2016 last year, our revenues are up uh, 630,000, but the, the biggest piece of that, and I'm gonna discuss in a few slides later, is um, compared to this fiscal year to last fiscal year, and compared to also to the forecast, our, our tax revenue through this point has increased about a million dollars and it's also uh, 1.4 million greater than the forecast which is good news and there's it's because of a few different factors which I'm going to break down and and kind of focus my presentation on that um, the other line items where the revenues netting down is uh, the the under the pers or under the property tax allocation um, it's a $700,000 decrease compared to this point it's from the TPP uh, this year we're getting the supplement and it's going to be brought under the, the state aid. Uh, we just received 80% of our supplement uh, yesterday actually and then the other 20% is going to come in June or July. If it's in July then it just is in the next fiscal year. Um, expenditures were about $75,000 um, different compared to last year to this year. We're, we're trending on target slightly under budget for expenditures. Hey George, just yes. a technical point. You need a seven on the third column over I think and on the other one too there's two 2016 oh you're correct I apologize so general fund revenues um, 
In the forecast, we forecast at 71.4 .4 million in revenues. Uh, year to date, we've received a 64.8 million. Uh, we're expected to receive another 8.2 million for a total revenues of 73.1. Um, that's an increase of 1.6 million. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest chunk of that is the property <coughs> tax revenues compared to what we forecasted is 1.5 million greater. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, it's not, it's not as much as the property taxes, but one thing we kind of focused on um, this year was our investments and our interest. So as you can see, we forecasted $20,000 in interest, which is right around what we received last year. Um, this year we switched our way we invested to a, we brought on meter for an investment firm and it's, as you can see, it's paying off. So far we received uh, $58,000 and we're also projecting to receive a lot, a few dollars more. We have some investments that are maturing from when we started in July this month. So I think it's gonna bump up that uh, $12,000 as well. So it was a, it was a big return. Um, the goal is to beat what Star Ohio or Star Plus is doing. So we, we kind of um, bucketed our investments. <coughs> Conservative, but it's doing a lot better than we've done historically. Nice so, job. Thanks. So as I mentioned, this is the part that I wanted to highlight is the property tax collections, the forecast versus the actual reconciliation. Um, there's a few different factors that go into um, the property taxes. I know it might sound simple, but there are different factors that go in into how they're collected, not so much how it's um, billed, but there's factors that come into play that um, swing our collections from year to year. Uh, the first one is, is the property taxes are billed and collected by the county on a calendar year basis, January through December, and our fiscal years on, on a fiscal year basis, July through <coughs> June. So we have a fiscal year that overlaps two calendar years or two collection years. So essentially the second half of a calendar year, um, so for calendar year 2016, July and August, that's the first half of our fiscal year. And then the first half collections of a calendar year, 2017, January through March, is the second half of our collection, of our fiscal year. Um, so at the time of the five-year forecast in the, in the fall, we've already received uh, the first half. So we're really forecasting out the second half, which is the the first half of calendar year 17. Um, also during that time period, because you are overlapping two calendar years, <coughs> the assessed valuation changes in that, ca in that calendar year. So at the end of, in December, the county um, recalculates the assessed valuation um, from the one calendar year to the next. So that also impacts collections as there are certain items that are not impacted by House Bill 920 such as uh, inside millage, that's not impacted by House Bill 920, so it's, it, the rate stays the same and it's taxed on whatever it is. Uh, new construction, what comes on, and the public utility valuation. Uh, the other big thing that hits us is the collection split. Uh, based on county averages, it's expected that 52% of the tax bill is to be paid in the first half collection period, which is the first half of the calendar year, while the remaining 48% is to be paid in the second half of the, of the collection period of the, the calendar year. Uh, for us, residential property, it's not, it's not been an issue. It's, it's over the 52-48 split's pretty much been consistent from year to year. <coughs> for us, it's the commercial property. Um, it's kind of been alternating from year to year. And I have a chart on the next slide to kind of show how that impacts us. Um, the next piece is the collection percentage. Percentage of taxes collected versus what was billed. Uh, for residential property, it's consistently been 98%, while commercial property, again, has kind of varied from year to year, uh, with a five-year average is what I use in the five-year forecast, which was 94%. Then the last piece is uh, collection of prior year delinquencies. Um, because we're not collecting at 100%, there are delinquencies out there that we receive. I also forecast um, an estimate of what I think we're going to get in delinquencies, and uh, this year we received slightly above that estimate. And then also there's refunds that are issued by the Board of Revisions. So when someone contests their property values, um, if they contest their property values and the Board of Revisions makes that adjustment after the tax bills have gone out, then we have to issue refunds the following years when the tax rate adjusts and it kind of makes us whole. But in that year, there's refunds that, issue, that are issued. Um, again, I include that in the forecast too. So um, it was slightly different than what I forecasted, which contributes to um, 
part of the difference. Uh, so moving on, the, <coughs> the changes in assessed valuations, just as a reference, uh, these, numbers are, these numbers are in billions. It's what our city of Strongsville is valued at. Um, in calendar year 2015, just as a reference, it was 1.417 1 billion. Um, calendar year 2016, it was 1,446 billion. And uh, what I forecasted for calendar year 17 was 1,454,000,000. 1, 1, and what actually came in um, was slightly more of 1,466,000,000. And on the bottom, I put what contributed to new construction as that. It, that actually impacts the revenue of what we collect. So in calendar year 15, we brought on 9 million of new valuation. In calendar year 16, it was 14 million. In the forecast, I estimated 7 million. What we actually brought on for calendar year 17 was 17.3 million. And again, when I'm doing these valuation and these estimates in the forecast, I try to stay conservative on them just because it, it does impact collections. So you don't want to estimate too much and then not get it as well. Um, so seeing that spike is, is good for the city, good for us as well. Uh, the collection split, uh, two charts. The first one is the residential, then the second one's the uh, commercial. As I mentioned, um, our fiscal year overlaps their calendar year. So where, the, where I have the arrows, that's in sync with the calendar year. Um, as you can see, residential, it's been pretty consistent, uh, 47 point, uh, 30, well, 47 some change percent versus the 52.75 that's kind of been across the board. Um, so really it didn't impact us there. It was the commercial, as you can see. Um, in fiscal year 13, um, it kind of was flipped. And then in 14, where it alternated, you had 50% of the one collection of the one half of the calendar year and then the starting the next ca half of the calendar year, it was a greater percentage, so it was all in one fiscal year, which kind of inflated our taxes. Then in 15, you had both the lower ends. Then 16, it kind of alternated again. You had the higher ends. So when I did the forecast, I assumed that trend would continue, um, but it it appears so far it, it normalized based on the first half settlement of calendar year 17, which you're starting to see a normal split. So Hopefully that trend continues because it's easier to forecast than it kind of flipping back and forth each year. And then the next slide is the collection rate. Um, again, the arrows represent the calendar years that they're associated with. As you can see, residential has been pretty much consistent year over year. Uh, the commercial collection, um, as you can see, has kind of been varied. We're in fiscal year 12. It's your calendar year 12 is 94 percent, calendar year 13 is 92 percent, uh, calendar year 14 up to 95, 15 down to 89, um, la last year 97. So when I was doing the estimate, I didn't want to go with the 97 percent because I didn't know where it was going to land based on the past trends, especially the year before being 89. So I took a five-year average, was, which is the 93.88. Um, so, so far in this half, I won't be able to know the true collection rate until we get the fall collected to see one full calendar year, but it's looking like it's around the 98%. So we saw an increase there, which is good as well. So that contributed to the higher revenue. So the next slide kind of breaks it down on why the, um, the tax revenue was so much higher than the forecast. And then also have 16s just as a comparison. <coughs> so the changes to new valuations not subject to House Bill 920, um, it was, Overall was 600,000, which was 240,000 above the forecast. Uh, the change in the collection split, it was 600,000 above the forecast. A change in collection rate uh, generated about 646,000, which was about 400,000 more than the forecast. Uh, collection of prior delinquencies uh, um, brought in about a million dollars, which was 160,000 more than the forecast. Uh, re refunds issued, I estimated that we would issue about 435,000. Last year, we issued 870,000. Um, so um, in the fiscal, this fiscal year, we, we issued 328,000. So that came in 107,000 better than the forecast. So overall, all these different changes add up to 1.5 million. Um, I was asked a question earlier, which, 
which one of these are real or which one of these are timing. Um, the one that's timing is the collection split. 601. Yeah, the 601. The rest, the, the House Bill 920, that's real. That should carry year to year. The only thing with that, if the collection, if the assessed valuation ever decreases, that amount would decrease as well with it because it's not subject to House Bill 920. Uh, the prior year delinquencies, it's real, but it's a one time. Um, if, the, if those continue like that, um, it would be real, but in the, I'm doing the five-year forecast at the next board meeting, and I'm estimating about 700,000 well, for the calendar year. I got to see what the estimate is, but I met, there's an amount in there that's being estimated. Same thing with the, with the refunds as well. Every year we kind of estimate for that. So that's, that's the summary on the property tax. If anyone, if anyone has any questions. No, nope, nice job. Thanks. <clears throat> so just moving on, I'll be quick with the rest of it. Uh, revenues by category, as you can see, other than the taxes, everything else is, is pretty consistent year over year. Um, our expenditures. We're through in March, where 75% of the year has passed. Um, our expenditures and, our, and encumbrances up to this point is 72.2%, so we're trending under budget uh, through March, and it appears through the rest of the year, too, we're going to be slightly under budget. Expenditures, as you can see, it's, it's um, pretty consistent year over year on where we're at for this, this time of the year based on the chart on the left. Um, the chart on the right, the actual expenditures. As you can see, it's, it's pretty consistent. And our general fund cash balance, um, for the year, we received uh, $64.8 million in revenue. We expended 50.2, where revenues over cash of um, 14.5 14, $14 million, which is our largest chunk of revenue is tax, tax dollars, and we received all our tax dollars for the year. So. Through the rest of the year, our, expense, our expenditures should outweigh our, our revenues. And um, our ending cash balance is 32.9 million, and our unencumbered cash is 30.3. Then the chart on the right is our cash balance for the last three years. And our 60-day um, cash reserve mark is about 11 million, and you can see we're well, we're well above that at this point in time. So that concludes my presentation, if there's any questions. Well, nope, that's a nice looking chart when every year the cash balance is a little bit higher, so that's right. a great sign. And also, um, nice work on ferreting out that the timing difference. I wasn't sure exactly where you were going with that, right? But uh, trying to determine that one when we when we saw the 1.5 difference, yeah. is it real? Isn't that was a good job right. getting Thank to you. that? So it was a little brutal in the uh, going through yeah. <laughs> trying to figure that out, but it was yeah, uh, I figured visuals was the best yeah. way to show it, yep, because I had a hard time trying to explain it, yeah, yeah. I thought so it's confusing. listening to it, but it was, uh, <laughs> 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 but it was uh, a nice job in getting to the answer, yep. the real yeah. answer, because that's what's the critical part is what's what's real and what's not. Right. Right. So, and excellent. then um, next month I'll have my May five year forecast at the work set, at the work session. Cool. So, that that. so I'm going to go back in the rest of the items on the agenda. So, so the next item is a uh, fund to fund transfer. Uh, be a result upon the recommendation of the treasurer that a fund to fund transfer in the amount of 81,000 be approved to fund the Albion Middle School demolition abatement project to additional unforeseen expenses. <coughs> Under the business service update, you'll see there's a change order. Um, initially, we did a transfer, if you recall, a few months ago for 120,000 for, 120, for abatement and um, asbestos at Albion. While they got in there doing the work, they discovered additional um, um, asbestos that was in the ground on the exterior wall that went into the soil that couldn't be seen. So it, it cost another, an additional 80000 So it's money being taken from the middle school savings that we've had in the contingency in the middle school to be transferred over to Albion Middle School for the demolition. Item C, new fund for t the school year 2017. Or 2017. Uh, Ms. Turner went out and got applied and received a grant for uh, from GPD, their foundation for makerspace for the high school. So it was a, as you can see on the next item, at, on item D, it's for $20,000. So item D is approving the grant from GPD. Outstanding, so. Vicky. Really nice job. <laughs> and you said you were getting your superintendents? Oh. Hmm. 
<laughs> nice job on that. And GPD, you know, a great partner, designed near our middle school and all the other textual work they've done for us and helping out on the excellence campaign and Absolutely, everything else. Yeah. What a great, what a great group. And then uh, the last item, item E, is uh, changing the appropriation measure, uh, appropriating the twenty thousand the grant, and also some few routine maintenance cleanup items in there as well. And that can be found on Exhibit B. Excellent. And if there's no questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Yeah, nice job. Cameron? All right, on our superintendent's report, I am going to skip timely information um, for this month due to time. Uh, and <laughs> and it's timely. It's it timely. is very timely that we need to keep going. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that we had uh, are later on in May, uh, so we'll still be able to use that uh, next meeting. Uh, moving on to business services, as George just mentioned, uh, with the asbestos at the Albion Middle School, this is the change order. Be resolved, uh, my recommendation, that you approve the execution of a change order with Hammond Construction for asbestos abatement at Albion Middle School, gym floor and retaining wall at a cost of $201,859.70, and funding from the Middle School Construction Fund in Exhibit C. And we did have a final meeting with uh, Roger Riachi and... Uh, Derek and Kyle from Hammond, everybody has viewed it, everybody has uh, reviewed everything, um, and this is absolutely the best price we could get to move that much asbestos in the manner in which they had to move it. Uh, so all of our construction partners are uh, satisfied with the dollar figure. Although disappointing, it's the reality of what, what it, it cost us to safely dispose of that material. Do you have a motion? So, so move. <laughs> Thank you, Duke. I'll Thank you, George. Um, any Further discussion? Um, you mentioned that Hammond and Roger, uh, Roger Ratchet reviewed it and George are all over it. So, uh, I spoke to Roger. Take roll. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Nasa? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, number two, transportation of non-public students. Uh, be it my recommendation uh, that school bus transportation for the students at the Al Hassan School of Excellence be declared impractical uh, for the reasons listed and that uh, you authorize us to, in lieu of providing transportation, pay the parents of the students attending the school and the reimbursement will be based on the amount allotted by the state. And then finally, under business services, under number three, we have two gifts uh, to, to share. The Media Group uh, donated $150 to the Industrial Tech Department at Strongsville High School. And as we just uh, shared, uh, again, the official uh, donation of the GPD Group Employees Foundation of $20,000 to the high school makerspace. So that is the business service report, unless there's questions. With that, next up, we have Aaron Green again um, to share some updates under curriculum. Okay, tonight we have five items for your consideration under curriculum. Uh, first one is always exciting, our list of potential graduates for ceremonies to be held on June 4th, 2017, as shown in Exhibit D. Um, be it resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent that the list of potential graduates be approved to participate in Strongsville High School commencement. Final approval is contingent upon successful completion of all the requirements for graduation. Second item is the official summer school dates. We have elementary summer school from June 12th through the 30th and secondary from June 12th through July 13th, 2017. For number three, we have a student-teacher agreement. Um, recommendation of the superintendent that the student-teacher agreement between Ashland University and Strongsville City Schools be approved as presented in Exhibit E. For item four, we have another field experience. Um, this one's for an al alternate, alternative resident educator license. Um, this one is actually for English language learner and we are having um, this person work between Kinsner and Moraski schools assigned to one of our staff members for 25 hours from April 21st through June 7th. And lastly, student teacher field experiences. We have field experience recommendations for one at Kinsner Elementary School from September 5th through December 8th from uh, Ashland University student and one at Chapman Elementary School for a kindergarten classroom from September 18th 
through December 8th. Again, a student at Ashland University. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank uh, you. Next, we have Andy Trujillo, Director of Special Education with this month's Student Service Report. Good evening, members of the board. I have three items for your consideration this evening. The first is a renewal agreement with Jefferson County Educational Service Center. Um, enter into another two-year agreement with them. They offer an internet-based curriculum for our students at the high school in the ASAP program for educational op opportunities for credit deficiencies, alternative programs and summer school programs for those students. Um, that is Exhibit F and paid for through the Alternative Challenge Grant uh, for, through Ohio. Next is an amendment with the agreement with PSI for our nursing. We needed to increase some nursing support at the middle school. Um, Part-time help during the busy time of the day around lunch. Um, and so that amendment there reflects that change in Exhibit G. And lastly, um, enter into an agreement with North Coast Therapy Associates for next school year. They provide our occupational and physical therapy services for our students with disabilities and that is also paid for out of federal entitlement grant money. Okay. Any questions? Number two, the yes. increase in nursing. Yeah. Um, um, my assumption is we had two nurses when we had two middle schools. We went to a single middle school, did we just have one nurse? We had one there all day, and then we had somebody working basically part-time in the middle of the day that was focusing her time on some of our special ed students, and that's all we had. And so that we, we went ahead and did increase some time. Um, Jenny Palco and I looked at the data. We keep um, a real-time spreadsheet that the nurses fill out throughout the day so we can see the needs and what happens with that student. And then we met with the district nurse, Crystal Tackleberry, made the decision that they did, did need a, some additional support at the middle school. So we did start the year with less than two full-time nurses that we had previously. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, so, yeah. so we're, we're basically we're going back. Less. We're still last, but okay. But yeah. Got it. Any other questions? Okay. Right. Nope, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And then uh, Assistant Superintendent Jenny Pelko with our Human Resource Report. Thank you, Mr. Iba. Good evening, everyone. I have the following items under Human Resources for your consideration this evening. Under E1, I have the non renewal of an administrative contract. Under E2, I have the reduction of force of a non-certificated uh, staff member. This is actually a return to reduction in force for an additional year uh, for the staff member. Under E3, I have a um, change of date in the resignation of a leadership position. I have a certificated resignation, a non-certificated resignation, and under E4, I have a two certificated uh, retirements. Continued under E4, uh, the following are our non-certificated retirements for this year. Under E5, we have the following uh, certificated appointment uh, for a long-term substitute contract. And then for the result below, we have two certificated um, personnel to be hired for the 2017-18 school year. Also have an appointment of a non-certificated staff Continued under E5, the appointment of a certificated substitute, appointments of non-certificated substitutes, and appointments of certificated supplemental contracts. And then continued on the next page under E5, the appointments of our certificated supplemental contracts paid upon, upon completion. One appointment of a certificated tutor. Under E6, we have the stipend for our Jumpstart Program Coordinator. We have the stipend for our weight room supervisor for this spring, 2017. Under E7, we have the appointment of uh, approval of a job share for next year. Under E8, one salary upgraded, upgrade for non-certificated personnel. Under E9, two changes in status for reductions in force to take place next year. Under E10, two contract res uh, recommendations for our uh, junior Air Force ROTC instructors. Under E11, continuing contract recommenda recommendation of a certificated staff member. Also continuing contract recommendations for non-certificated staff members. Under E12, I have unpaid medical leaves for certificated staff and unpaid medical leaves for non-certificated staff. Under E13, 
we have one uh, administrative medical leave and follow, following that certificated medical leaves and non-certificated medical leaves. Under E14, volunteer chaperones to be approved. And under E15, we have the non-certificated arbitration decision. And that concludes my report, unless you have any questions for me. All volunteers obviously go through background checks. <coughs> Correct. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Jenny. And we do not have any items under technology this evening, so that concludes uh, my report. All right. Thank you, Cameron. Um, trying to catch up. That was a lot. <clears throat> Uh, that brings us to our report, uh, Richard. Report on Polaris. A um, couple of uh, announcements or uh, calendar updates. Uh, April, Saturday, April 22nd from 9, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Polaris Career Center, uh, Bob Gillingham Ford is having a uh, Take the Wheel and Help Your School uh, program. It is no cost to you. Uh, if you do show up, you test drive one of uh, Bob's Ford cars, and in exchange for test driving the car, uh, Gillingham Ford will donate $20 to the business professional and office technology and the automotive programs. So if you needed an excuse to uh, test drive a, a new Ford, that's a way to do it and help Polaris at the same time. If you have some children that are learning to be drivers, this is a great way for them to uh, drive someone else's car. And Rob, I mean, he's a he's a Rotarian. He's a great guy. So I mean, he's it's just a great a great program, and it's just uh, we're real thankful that he offered to do that. And it's it's fun and uh, benefits the students at the same time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to announce that uh, some of our Polaris business students. Uh, won at some of the various state competitions that they uh, attended to, and uh, we have a number of those students. Uh, 23 Polaris students uh, were competing at the state level, and six finished in the top five, and will uh, compete at the National Business Professionals of America uh, program in Orlando, Florida in May. Uh, I want to announce that on May 4th, uh, which is a Thursday from 6 to 7.30, uh, Polaris has their ninth grade advantage program. Uh, if you're a ninth grader and considering Polaris, it lets you uh, visit the campus, look at all the different uh, programs that they offer, uh, try them out, meet with the, inst uh, the teachers, and if you attend, you get a free gift just for attending. Um, in addition, uh, Polaris is on uh, Wednesday, April 26th from 6 p.m., uh, beginning at 6 p.m., uh, Polaris is having a program to go over their different satellite programs and their campus programs that have college credit. Um, so that might be uh, interest to parents uh, with a prospective 11th or 12th grade uh, student. And then uh, last, uh, kudos and congratulations to the Polaris uh, Baking and Pastry Arts program. They won regional honors uh, in Columbus and they will uh, continue uh, in their uh, competition cycle and where is the name? Um, Megan, we want to congratulate Megan Lamb, from, who's a junior at uh, Strongsville High School. And we want to congratulate Natalie Turchin, who's also a junior at Strongsville High School. And that completes my Polaris report. Good job. Uh, legislation? Uh, the same theme as always, uh, at least until the, the new budget is uh, passed. Um, but the House will be. Um, will be uh, delivering House Bill 49, uh, which is the number assigned, and it will be their, uh, their response to the governor's uh, initial proposal for the next biennium budget. The big news that came out uh, approximately a week ago is that the, uh, Columbus has identified approximately an 800 to 900 million shortfall in their projections over for the next uh, biennium budget. And so uh, there was a uh, press conference with uh, Governor Kasich, uh, along with uh, the House and the state, uh, the Senate, um, discussing how they're going to have to trim back approximately $400,000 from each year of the next uh, budget. Um, so we have our slide, uh, which I know uh, we're making sure all the viewers at home can see. Um, but the issue, again, is that Strongsville is uh, is taking the lion's share of the cut in this budget 
uh, in a budget that overall is a small 1 to 2 percent increase for K to 12 education. Um, so make sure to contact the governor along with State Rep Tom Patton and State Senator Matt Dolan uh, to express your displeasure. Uh, on, our, on our school website, we have some talking points and we have a, uh, a boilerplate letter that you can send them, but also make sure to call them. Um, it's not always uh, understood, but, the, uh, but both, uh, both Rep Patton and Senator Dolan do respond to those uh, phone calls and they do mean a lot uh, for when they're, uh, they're trying to gauge public interest and public opinion. And that concludes my legislative report. Thank you. Uh, brings us the board liaison reports. Jane, City Council. Okay, City Council. Thank you, Mr. Naso. We had um, our own superintendent speaking at the uh, April 3rd City Council meeting regarding the state funding, and that was very well received, and they pledged to um, get behind our district and uh, voice their displeasure with uh, the, our representatives as well. So that was um, a, a worthwhile use of your time. <laughs> and they also, at the last city council meeting, were um, asking residents to be mindful of the fact that uh, it's springtime and people are driving a little faster. There's children that are out and about creating a little bit of havoc uh, throughout the city. So if you see something that doesn't look right, they're asking you to contact the police station. Um, even if it's as simple as, hey, I left my car in my driveway and somebody rifled through it, I don't think anything was missing, they still want to hear that because they want to be able to gauge what's going on in our community. So, um, but they also did ask that you always lock your cars and lock your houses and just to try and thwart um, the random acts of... Uh, um, mischief. Yes, that, thank you, mischief. Um, then they also, we have um, some announcements. The uh, prescription drug take back program is April 29th. Uh, that's where they collect all unwanted medication, prescription medication that might be in our medicine cabinets. And that is at the Strongsville Police Station from 10 to 2. So um, if you'd um, like to get rid of some drugs a, a safe way and rather than flushing them or putting them into our um, water su supply, that would be appreciated. And the <laughs> Ward 3 Fire Station is having their grand reopening after they've renovated it on April 30th from 1 to 3. So if you'd like to come and see the fire station in Ward 3, they'd um, welcome you to be there. <laughs> and that ends my City Council report. Thank you, Jane. You want uh, PTA? Is that you? Um, George would be PTA. Mm -hmm. All right. Actually, I have not been able. I was not able to attend the last meeting, um, so we will give a report next month. All right. So that brings us to student achievement. You know, we had so much student achievement exemplified at the beginning of our meeting. I think it speaks for itself <laughs> so, all that we're able to accomplish so. in this district. So excellent. They gave my report for me. Yeah, they sure did. That was excellent. Um, that brings us to finance. Uh, I think that is oh, uh, Stars Education Foundation. Um, Jockeys and Juleps is coming up on May 6th. 6th. Uh, there are still tickets available. It is truly one of the best events in the city. Uh, I highly encourage anybody who, who would like to go to go. There are also uh, scholar or sponsorships available for, for certain races that are still left. Uh, so we're looking for that. That gets you tickets in and uh, VIP passes, all kinds of stuff. Um, really very uh, reasonably priced. So if you can uh, reach out to the website or get a hold of um, Brian Jungerberg or any of the other members of the committee, um, it's really a good event and I think uh, we we, we really like to fill that up. Uh, they do a lot go. of great things for the district. So. You have to go. So it's a great time. Grab a it big a hat and grab a bow tie and, <laughs> you know, yeah, have a lot of fun. Some fancy socks. Fancy socks. I have fancy, fancy socks. socks. George is wearing fancy socks today. So um, so that's all I have. Anything else? There's anything else we want to add on Education Foundation? All right. Uh, that brings us to uh, board committee reports. Uh, we didn't have a finance committee meeting. Um, I would like, not necessarily a committee meeting, but I'd like to get George, myself, and uh, Duke together to talk about uh, when our next meeting will be and, and maybe 
reorganize that a little bit. So I think we should we should talk about that how we want to move that forward. Um, brings us to policy committee. Nothing's going on yet. Oh, we're we're <laughs> waiting for the date. Oh, we have we have the next batch in. We just have to set a date. So. Oh. So as soon wow. as we get that date, we'll make sure to announce it Absolutely. loud and wide, and wow. maybe we'll get someone else to show up. <laughs> <laughs> Not likely. Um, <clears throat> facilities committee meeting, uh, we didn't have one since the last meeting? Nope. The next one's going to be um, on April 27th at 6.30 at Chapman Elementary. At Chapman Elementary. 427 at 427. 6.30. Chapman. Okay. Uh, that brings us to the consent calendar. All items with an asterisk are voted on in one vote. Um, do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Duke. Second. Thanks, Jane. Um, there are no modifications or corrections that I'm aware of to any of the items. So if there's any discussion on any items, Treasurer? Colonel Evans? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Niso? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. Um, Board of Education or other? Anybody have any others? I had a quick one. Going back to what Richard was talking about on the uh, funding, you know, the state of Ohio is coming up short with their tax revenue, so they're all scrambling down there in Columbus trying to figure out what I think they're, they're blaming the Russians, I heard. Yeah, probably. <clears throat> um, but the thing is, I also had the opportunity to talk to Representative Patton, and our inputs are making a difference. They are actively, according to him, working to resolve the budget issue and understand that Strongsville has been hit harder than other districts. So my message to the community, my request or plea would be keep up the pressure. Keep up the letters, keep up the calls, do what Richard said, make them know that we're not gonna take this land down and it's not just them telling us, Kasich telling us, oh, go tax your, your community more because that's basically what they've said to us and that's unacceptable. So. That's a, just wanted to say that every right. every meeting. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Yeah, we're good. Uh, meeting notifications. We do have a meeting coming up on Thursday, May 4th, and May 18th. Uh, both of them are in this. Mm -mm. No, no, they are not. Mm -hmm. The exciting meeting on May 18th will be in the Strongsville Middle School Auditorium. Excellent. With that. Well, we do have need for an executive session for the following items. Uh, to consider the employment and compensation of a public employer official and to prepare for or to review negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees concerning compensation or other terms and conditions for employment. All right, do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Duke. Second. Thank you, Jane. Any further discussion, George? Colonel Evans? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Neso? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Enter an executive session at? 9.05. Mr. Naso, uh, we may need, have need to come back to public session after executive session for board action, so I just want to make you aware of that. Okay. It's possible we may resume. The <laughs> marathon. <laughs> Please, nobody leave. Stay in your seats. <laughs> the suspense should kill all of you. A little chilly now. <laughs> yeah, wow, it really got you. No. Um, item number 11. Item number 11, resolution, resignation of an employed contract, uh, be it resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent to be adopted the resignation of administrative and teaching contracts for Bethany Kuhn Britt. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Duke. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? George, take roll. Colonel Evans? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Naso? Yes. Motion passes. Excellent. Mr. Naso, we have adjournment. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I have a second. second. Thank you, Jane. Take roll. Discussion? Any discussion about adjournment, Richard? Do you want a second? And you want a second chance for public comment? <laughs> That's okay. Are the tapes rolling? Yes. <laughs> Take roll. Colonel Owens? Yes. Mrs. Ludwig? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. Mr. Naso? Yes. Mr. Grozan? Yes. Meeting adjourned at 1032 p.m. <laughs>